So we've examined all the personal and uh, evidence-based reasons for wanting to have a better approach uh, to uh, helping patients make better decisions. Uh, and it's based on a different model of learning. Um, and this is, uh, gets at uh, what uh, the people in motivational interviewing call the spirit of motiv motivational interviewing. It takes into account all the things that we use as individuals uh, to make decisions and to move towards uh, action. Uh, and it's much more than just pumping knowledge into people. It's taking advantage of their own uh, aspirations, uh, using their own beliefs and values to help them uh, move ahead, and then providing opportunities uh, for them uh, to uh, actualize their aspirations. Um, it requires us to begin to think about our own reasons for being interested in patient motivation. Is it about them getting them to do what we want? Or is it about helping them to make better decisions in their personal journey, providing resources for self-efficacy? When we talk to a, a grandmother who's having to make a decision about her own medications and decent food for her grandchild, uh, we realize that this isn't just about information. This is about helping a person being able to settle, to, to uh, make appropriate priorities. And it may be that for that particular point in time, they've made the best decision by skipping their medications. Uh, so we have to be open to understanding the social realities of our patients, the personal beliefs and aspirations they have if we're going to influence motivation. Um, we can do a lot structurally to help form a partnership with our patients. Uh, we can do something about access. Uh, there's a lot of work in literacy that we can take advantage of. Uh, it's important to have people on your staff who come from your target communities and also to uh, support involvement by your staff in community events. Uh, as a physician, I uh, felt uh, uh, victimized by being told I had to go to customer relations training, but I learned a great deal from it. And finally, we have to use what I call a person-directed approach. Uh, Patient-centered doesn't seem to work for most of my uh, uh, practices that I work with. Everybody says we're already patient-centered. This idea of person direction is a change of control, and it's a much harder change to make in our care. So let's look at what person-directed care is. It means eliciting aspirations, strengths, and weaknesses. It means helping people to clarify the value and importance of each of the uh, actions they might take. It means exploring with them pathways and the obstacles to pursuing their own aspirations, and then taking advantage of their strengths in dealing with other issues in their lives to help them deal with these new issues. We began to ask ourselves, well, what do those people want? We're giving them all this information and they're still not following our advice. And so someone suggested, well, why don't we bring them in and talk to them? So we had meetings back in our lunchroom with four or five people at a time from the local communities. And we asked them, what do you want? And they said, well, am I welcome here? Uh, and, and how would you know? Well, convenience and comfort. Uh, asking about and responding to my worries, that would help. Uh, do I belong here? Are there people like me getting or giving care here? This is particularly important for people in minorities or excluded groups who are, don't know whether they can trust the people that are, that are in the office to, to have their welfare at heart. Uh, privacy issues come into that as well. And is there any, uh, awareness in the community of the caregivers in, in the office? Do they make appearances at church events, at health fairs, in, in other ways that they can start to become uh, respected in the communities? Because when people leave the office, they go home to their reference community and people say, well, I don't know who that person is, but those statins made me get cramps. I think you should just throw them in the garbage. You don't want somebody's angry aunt to be more important 
as an advisor than you are. And finally, especially when we talk to men about their experience with uh, a medical care, they simply said, can you just consult me? Do I have a say in what's going on? Can you please discuss the strategy with me? Uh, and finally, I have to have the final say. Next slide. So that leads us to the basics of the motivational interviewing spirit. And you'll see right there that last question, I have to be in charge. Patient autonomy is essential. Collaboration, let's do this together. Let's share the strategy with me. Evocation, listen to me. Uh, help, you know, try to understand the challenges I'm facing as a patient. And finally, respect the difficult emotions and choices I'm facing. It isn't easy uh, if, if it's something that I haven't accomplished yet. So these four items are the key points you wanna keep coming back to. And whether what the practice decides to do to improve engagement is on the list of motivational uh, interviewing tools or not, doesn't matter. It's does it help with collaboration, evocation, autonomy, and compassion. Uh, this is a way of thinking about uh, some of the MI skills. They use the ORS acronym, open-ended questioning, questions that can't be answered yes or no. Affirming, try to find something positive about that patient, something that you can show your respect for and build on that to help them through to thinking about things they need to change. Reflecting is a very powerful technique to use with patients. It says, I'm listening. Uh, what I heard you say was, your story tells me uh, uh, what I've learned from uh, uh, what you just said. Those kinds of things allow the patient to begin to be teaching you about themselves. And being a teacher rather than a victim or a subject is a very empowering position for your patients. And finally, summarizing. Help people, after they've laid out on the table their feelings and beliefs, help them kind of see what, what that all looks like held together. You feel like that none of your pills will work for you unless you deal with stress. That's kind of a summary for them to say, well, obviously the next step is let's talk about that stress. There are MI strategies and Probably the most interesting one is the concept of ambivalence. Uh, and that means that anybody who's thinking about a change is balancing the way things are with the way things would be with a change. Uh, and we constantly are forcing our patients to change based on life events, but also clinical information we give them. Um, we may perceive ambivalence as resistance. We may say, well, I'm not even gonna talk to that patient about smoking anymore. They're just not interested. Instead, the MI strategy is to say, everybody is ambivalent about change. They may be leaning way in one direction or another, but there is enough ambivalence for you to connect to it and to help them talk about it and make a better decision. And it's in talking about that ambivalence, in our listening to that ambivalence, that we start to identify change talk. Talk about what it would be like if I did change. And that's the key element of motivational interviewing. So we're listening for certain kinds of statements. And uh, I, I like to talk about those, uh, the acronym I use is darn cat. You're looking for statements of desire. I want, I wish, ability, I can, reason. If I do, then what? Need, I have to, I should. Those are statements that you can connect to and reflect. It sounds like you really do have the desire to change. It sounds like you feel you really need to do this. Um, and that reflection will then lead for the patient to talk some more about that need. Uh, once you begin to have those conversations, you can begin to 
hear statements about commitment to change. I will, I'd like to, I intend to. Or evidence that people have already begun taking steps. I went to the reservoir to walk. I started counting the pills every day. And ultimately, to help people help others as a final step in their healing, uh, I showed this to my neighbor. I helped my son make better decisions about his diet. So these strategies help you connect to the patient, connect to their ambivalence in a positive way to help them begin to see that they too want to improve things. And the two of you can be partners in working on that. So I just summarized for you, and you can review these when you get the slide set, but the interaction was really non-accusatory, so different from the other one. The clinician wasn't lecturing all the time, was listening, evoking, nodding, uh, using reflection and summary, as a lot of you have pointed out, to explore the parent's ambivalence. And then takes advantage of the change talk, I want to stop smoking, to direct the conversation towards the patient's previous attempts to quit, which have been successful build on that. And as you can see, the parent is now convincing herself that she can do it, instead of coming away believing that she's weak and harming her child. So now the discussion is about the parent's confidence and options, and shared decision-making is underway. <laughs>